All right, let's go back and go through, you know, where you, where you kind of, I was in a rush Sunday morning because uh, I start talking and I can't stop. And so I just want to go back and review some of the details, it, take a little bit slower run at some of these details concerning holiness. You know, we know that the standard of the church is holiness. We've talked about the heresy of our day where they want to, they want to bring in the whole world into the church and be loving and accepting of all kinds of lifestyles and personal preferences. And that's not the Bible. The church of the Bible is a church that is without spot or wrinkle preparing herself for the coming of the Lord. And we said just very simply, church is for the church. Church is not for the unbeliever. Are unbelievers allowed to come in and visit? Absolutely, anytime. But remember in Corinthians, they're going to have one or two reactions to what they see. They're either going to be convicted and repent, or they're going to walk out saying, you guys are crazy. But the last thing that we do, the one thing that we don't do, is alter the exercise of our faith and the practice of our faith to make them more comfortable or to make them feel more included. Uh, they can come watch us all they want, and hopefully they will be saved. But remember, we uh, talked Sunday morning, you are the Billy Grahams. You are the evangelists. It's you out in the street, on the job, at the shopping mall, with your neighbors. You are the one sharing the gospel and then bringing them into the church. But what we do here in church is holy. The word of God that we teach is holy. The worship that we bring before the throne of God is holy. You know, one of the things that just goes all through me, I saw it again in an article, and I can't remember the guy's name. He's some famous worship leader, and he went on, oh, some worship leader was singing on, uh, I think, The Voice. Is that one of those singing competitions? And uh, so the headlines read, so-and-so brings worship to the voice. Just like the other day, you know, Lauren Daigle brings worship to late night. That is a room full of unbelievers. There wasn't any worship going on. You, you can't, you can't, what fellowship has light with darkness? What fellowship has believers with unbelievers? You can't bring unbelievers in to the worship of God, which is holy. They don't have the Spirit of God living in their heart. Now, maybe some of them could be moved. Some of them could even be convicted of the Holy Spirit. Some of them could be moved emotionally by the music. But we've got to wise up, folks. Uh, that's mingling the... the that's mingling the holy with the profane, and that's not right before God. The church is to be without spot or wrinkle, holy, without blemish. And then we did talk about the, the very important part of practice versus weakness. The practice of sin is when someone willingly, willfully, deliberately, knowingly, intentionally... What other synonyms can we throw in there? You know, they, they just out of pride and self-will refuse to repent. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more tonight. But then Christians as a rule suffer under the sin of weakness. You know, we sin because we're not properly prepared spiritually. Jesus said this, watch and pray that you enter not into what? Temptation. So if you enter into temptation, it's because you didn't watch and pray enough. If you enter into temptation, it's because you weren't spiritually prepared by the Word of God and by prayer enough. But in this a day and age that we live in, we all have occasions where we fall and commit a sin of weakness, but it's not what we want. It's not who we are. We feel guilty and terrible after it, and we seek God's forgiveness and when that happens, Paul says in Romans chapter 7 that it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin that dwells within my flesh. The sin that I just committed, I hate. I don't want to do it. I repent of it. But that sin does not define who I am. And it's not what I want to be doing. 
And so there's a big difference in the scriptures between practicing sin, but then being overcome in a moment of weakness. And we saw that there in 1 John, where it says, uh, excuse me, I'm going the wrong direction here. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. If you are a born-again Christian and God's word is in your heart, you feel terrible after you sin. You feel convicted. You feel the guilt. And you can't keep on practicing that sin over and over again because you've been born of God. He cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. The verse above, it says whoever practices sin is of the devil. They're not a Christian, so don't be deceived by vain words. So we talked about, you know, willful practice of sin which is quite different from being overcome in a moment of weakness and which we, we all contend with that on a daily basis. Let's read through this passage in Acts chapter 5 more casually than more slowly than we did Sunday morning because we were saying Sunday morning in the church assembly, in the church of Jesus Christ, not in the buildings that are religious institutions, not in denominations necessarily, but in the church of Jesus Christ, there's two sins that God always judges, hidden and secret sin, and then number two, willful and recurring. Now watch this story here in Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained, and this is very important, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young man rose, young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. And then we know what happened to his wife in the following verses. I want you to tie this together with 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Meaning this, God is light, and he fully discloses all of his heart and his mind to his children. Now, there are a lot of things about his heart and mind and will that we can't comprehend yet with these natural brains but God fully divulges his whole heart to us. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. The darkness here is someone who is hiding things in secret. There's places in my heart and life I don't allow the Lord to go. I'm not fully surrendered to him. And so therefore I hold things back, I keep things secret, I hide portions of my heart and life and keep them in under my control. That is the darkness here in verse 6. And he says, God is light. He fully discloses himself to you. If you're walking in darkness and not fully surrendering, disclosing yourself to him, you don't have fellowship with him. So if your heart is not fully surrendered, if you're holding things back, if you're not honest about who and what you are, if you're not honestly surrendered to his will, you're not in fellowship with God, period. 
Now maybe, you know, maybe you're growing and learning what it's like, what it means to take up your cross, deny yourself and surrender to the Lord. And maybe you're growing in that surrender and growing in that sanctification. But if you're someone that is willfully retaining control of your not life, not fully divulging everything to him, there's no fellowship there. Now watch what happens in verse 7. If we walk in the light, if we're fully surrendered to the Lord, not having one area of our heart or life hidden or kept from him, if we walk in that light as he is in the light, we have what? We have fellowship with who? With one another. We have fellowship. See, church is the gathering of believers who have fully surrendered to God. And the blood of his son, the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from what? From all sin. You know, I've made the statement before, it's amazing what God can do with an honest heart, right? Ananias didn't have an honest heart. And back here in this story, we don't know exactly what happened because the details are not shared. But we have a whole bunch of people coming selling their land, selling their goods, and giving all to the Lord, giving all to the apostles to be distributed to the poor at this time. And for whatever reason, Ananias wanted that label on him. He wanted to be perceived as one of these spiritual people who were selling all and giving all. And so he was in it for the image. He was in it for the status. He was in it not to meet the needs of those people. He was in it to draw attention to himself, right? That in itself can be dealt with. That in itself can be forgiven and washed in the blood of Jesus. It was the dishonesty that caused the judgment to fall. When he made up the lie, when he presented a false image in hypocrisy, when he lusted after man's approval instead of God's approval, and he hide, hid what really happened in his heart, God will always judge hidden and secret sin. Because the fact of the matter is, if you're not walking in the light, in verse 7, you can't have fellowship with his children. If you're not fully surrendered, if you're holding things in secret, you are not part of the church of Jesus Christ. And there is no fellowship there. You might come and church might make you feel better, might relieve your conscience for a day or two, but something is desperately wrong because of what you're hiding and holding on to without surrendering to God. And the blood of Jesus is not able to cleanse you. But as long as you're honest, honest about yourself, we can have fellowship together. I want to just go through these three bullet points quickly. Without honesty, there is no basis for trust. And without trust, there is no capacity for relationship. Can you imagine trying to have a marriage with a spouse who's always lying to you? And you can't trust them? Is there any relationship there? And without complete honesty before the Lord and absolute surrender, we don't have a relationship with God. There's, there's nothing, no capacity there to have a relationship. Honesty does not require full disclosure to the church assembly. Let me say that again. Honesty does not require full disclosure to the church assembly. We got two pendulums in the church right now. We have some churches that say, you can live any way you want. We don't care about your personal life. We don't even care if you come to church. Just please drop your tithe check off at the office. And we don't need to ever see you or know what you're doing. Well, that's one extreme, isn't it? And that's obviously a wrong extreme. And then you go all the way to the other extreme where you have churches, they don't want you to even buy a car without the pastor's permission. You have to get permission from the elders before you can marry someone or buy a house or, or uh, change your job. Or Well, that's obviously a cult that has gone 
and the pendulum has swung, swung to the far other end, right? Honesty does not require full disclosure to the church assembly, but it does require a heart attitude that is free from guile and pretense. Meaning this, I'm not hiding anything. I, I don't feel it necessary to tell you all of my life's secrets. Uh, it's, a lot of it's none of your business. But it becomes the church's business if you're bringing sin into the church. But it doesn't require, what we're talking about does not require a full disclosure. But is your heart free from guile and pretense? Are, are, you, are you being yourself? Are you being honest with God and the people? Or are you trying to put on a show? Are you a hypocrite, play acting? There is a healthy balance between autonomy and community. There is a healthy balance between autonomy and community. Like I said many times, my authority as a pastor stops at the front door. I teach the truth. I try to the best I can live the truth and to be an example. That's how I serve you as a shepherd. But when it comes down to the decisions of your life, that's between you and God. Remember that one phrase here? It said here in, uh, when talking about Ananias, Acts chapter 5, verse 4, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your what? Disposal? Ananias, you could have made the decision what to do with this money. It was under your control. Nobody was telling you you had to give all or give part. Nobody was telling you what to give. There was autonomy here and a decision-making process that Ananias owned. And if he had given 50% and kept 50%, that would have been completely fine. Nobody would have said anything. They would have been thankful for the 50% that he did give. What was the problem? The lie the hypocrisy, the play acting, the pretending to be something that you're not. And that's where we start to get into the trouble here of verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, but we're keeping secrets, we have secret parts of our life, secret sins, secret pride, secret selfishness, we're not yielded to God, then we don't know him. We don't have a relationship with him. And we can't have fellowship with one another at that point. All right, so two sins that God judges, hidden and secret. Are we walking in the light? Do you have that hard attitude? Doesn't mean that you have to come in and give a full disclosure at every service. It just means what is the condition of your heart? Do you live honestly? Are you yourself? It takes a long time for people just to be themselves a lot of times. And if there's anywhere that you can be yourself, it should be in church where you're loved and accepted. But secondly, let's look at this recurring sin. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him. How? Alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, I put in here this verse, the start of this verse in many different uh, tra in translations, and I don't want to muddy the waters here, but it, it really bears noting. Look at this in the ESV, if your brother sins against who? Against you. King James, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. CSB, Christian Standard Bible, if your brother sins against you. Now look at all the rest of these. New American Standard, if your brother sins. Period. Amplify, if your brother sins. The Net Bible, if your brother sins. NIV, if your brother or sister sins. Okay? So there, there's a little bit of ambiguity here. Are we talking about if you see your brother sin? Or are we just talking about when he sins against you? And I think you can see here from the translations, the answer is really both. 
It can, it, it can be both ways. It, in the early translations, is they were all, if your brother sins, period. The later manuscripts added that part, if your brother sins against you. Okay, minor point. If your brother sins, do what? Go and tell him his fault between you and him. How? Alone. You, as a member of this community, are responsible to keep this assembly pure. Yes, it's my job ultimately, but it's your job initially. Because especially as the church grows, you're going to know and see things that I never know and see. People do have a tendency to act one way around the pastor or a spiritual leader in the church and another way with the rest of the congregation. Go to him alone. So you're having this discussion with your brother, and I, at this point, as the pastor, don't know about it, don't need to know about it. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he does not listen, what are we talking about here? We're talking about willful, deliberate, recurring sin. This is not someone who's overcome in a moment of weakness and afterwards regrets it and repents. This is someone who's going to do it again, and he doesn't care what you say when you bring the Bible to him. If he refuses to listen to those two or three, tell it to who? The church. That's when I get involved where the elders get involved. And this person, who knows what he's doing, maybe to earn an income, he's robbing banks. And he thinks robbing banks is fine because he's the getaway driver. He's actually not inside the bank taking the money. So he thinks he's fine. He's a Christian, but he's robbing banks for a living. And now he's refused to hear two or three and so you bring it to the church, and again, as a member, as a hand, as a foot, as an eye, as an ear, as a knee, whatever you are in the body, you are protecting from, you are defending from this infection, this leaven, this poison from entering in and spreading. And so you take two or three more, and you say, look, Christians do not rob banks. That's stealing. You can't have any part of this. If he refuses to listen even to the church, then what do you do? Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And guess what? <laughs> He's, yeah. I mean, the worst thing you could be called back then was a tax collector. <laughs> right? Yeah. But if you were one of those, if you were a Gentile or a tax collector, you're not coming into church. Because church is for the church. Church is not for the unbelievers. And so this person is walked out of church. He's not allowed back. And then he goes on in verse 18, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He's saying, you guys, the church, have the authority to defend the purity of the church and to make the decision of who's in and who's out. That's what it's saying here. Now, to go on to this passage in 1 Corinthians that we read through very quickly on uh, Sunday, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that's not tolerated even among the pag pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. You're not mourning. Let him who has done this be what? Be removed from among you. So this is very similar to the Matthew 18 account where this guy is, he doesn't care who says what. He's continuing in this sin. He's not going to change. He's not going to repent. And so he's saying, I'm ordering you, I'm commanding you to pronounce judgment on the one who's done such a thing. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So he's turned out of the church. 
He's turned out of the companionship, the fellowship, the strengthening, the encouraging, the comfort of the church. And now he's going to feel the full consequences of his sin upon his life. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And this is, this sin is a venomous poison that's going to sicken and eventually kill the church from within if you allow sin to remain. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. He says, I wrote to you in my letter, verse 9, not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. And as Christians, we are supposed to be salt and light in the world. We're not supposed to build monasteries out in the desert and separate ourselves from the world. We're to be preaching the gospel in all nations. And so he's saying, yes, of course, when you're in the world, you're going to be surrounded by immoral unbelievers. But the difference is, in verse 11, I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality, greed, idolatry, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. With that person, don't even eat with them. They can't go to Bob Evans with you. Right? That's written in there somewhere. And so it's not, he's not talking about the worldly people. When you're in the world, you're going to be surrounded by sinners. But if any man is part of the church saying, I'm loved of God, forgiven of God, I'm a Christian, I'm in right standing with God, but practicing a lifestyle of sin, willfully separate yourself from that person. He says, for God judges those that are outside, but you are to judge those that are inside. Verse 12 and 13, purge the evil person from among you. So they carry this out. And watch what happens in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart. Much affliction, anguish of heart with many tears. This situation broke Paul's heart. If you have a pastor or an elder or a spiritual leader who takes pleasure in lowering the boom on someone and putting them under some harsh judgment or discipline, they are not of God. Because true shepherds will weep over the sin. They don't take joy in enforcing and demeaning somebody and enforcing judgment upon a person. I, I mean, there are pastors who are control freaks that really get off on that. And they believe they can somehow lift themselves higher by putting someone else down, and they rejoice in others' pain, and they rejoice in others' failures. And the Bible is very clear. Don't you rejoice when your brother falls because you'll be next. A true shepherd will, will cry in anguish to bring this discipline that Paul is talking about. It will bring him anguish of heart. Verse 5, If anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure not to put it too severely to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. You've put this man out of the fellowship... He's now begun to taste of the consequences of his sin. He has felt the discipline that's come from everybody in the church. They won't even eat with him. It's enough, guys. Now again, we are lacking some details here, but it's obvious that this man repented. So he was put out of the church. He realized the error of his ways. And he decided, I got to get right with God. I need to go back to the church and repent for my sin. And so he comes back and he repents. And so Paul says in verse 7, so you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. 
It's a horrible thing when you're not allowed to move on from your sin, but that sin is kept hanging over your head. And nobody will let you put it behind you so that you can move on with your life. He says in verse 8, and notice the strength of these words, so I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. I beg you. Because forgiveness and restoration is just as much a part of the gospel as the discipline was that you administered. And if you don't bring him back, he could be overwhelmed with excessive sorrow and he could just give up hope. Well, the church didn't forgive me. God must not forgive me. And that's not true. Now, let me end with one question here. Remember who this guy was. This was a guy living in incest. All right? He was having sexual relations with what we assume to be his stepmother, his father's wife. Would you let someone like that back in the church? God will. That God will wrap his arms around this person and freely forgive him and love him and restore him just like the father did the prodigal son with full rights and privileges all restored. So we really need to examine our own hearts in this and we're out of time so we'll have to pick this up again but I want you to see the power of the forgiveness and the restoration of the church. And if someone like this, who is living a life of incest, can come back and be forgiven and restored, so can you, and so can anybody else, as long as they are, like 1 John says, living in the light, not trying to hide anything. They come and they bring it all and they surrender. And God forgives them and restores them. Father, we thank you for the freedom of the gospel. We thank you, Lord, for your word to us. We thank you that we can come to you and confess our sins. You don't forgive us grudgingly. You forgive us willingly. You love to forgive us. You rejoice over us. There is great rejoicing in heaven when a sinner comes back to God. And so, Father, you delight in your children. You delight in their repentance. But there must be repentance. If we try to act like nothing's wrong and we're doing great, like Ananias, judgment will come. Because God won't allow that type of deceit and hypocrisy in his church. We come into an assembly where we can freely confess our sins, as James says, and we know that we will be loved and forgiven and received. But if we're trying to project a false image, God will rip it away. Father, as we go, we ask that we could go in honesty of heart tonight freely loved, freely forgiven by you. And your love, your gentleness causes us to run to you all the more and to fully surrender. Father, we ask that you would uncover every corner of darkness in our hearts and lives. Because only by that exposure Can you work to bring deliverance and healing? And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.